Today in our foray back into the 80s, we're going to look at the Spectra Video's cassette storage system, which came in two variants, the SV904, which was a plain old mono cassette deck that did nothing but store data. And then there was the 903, which is the one I've got, that was a stereo deck that had data on one channel and audio that was mixed with the system audio on the other channel, uh, presumably so that you could have voiceovers and music in the background while you loaded games or you know, whatever, whatever it was you wanted to do. So cassette storage in the 80s was generally based around consumer grade cassette tapes and consumer grade cassette decks. Uh, some systems on the other hand, like the Spectra Video, uh, customized their, their cassette decks slightly. Uh, the Spectra Video, for example, has its own, it's custom seven pin interface that carries power to the cassette deck, so you don't need an external plug pack. It, it carries audio from the deck into the system for playback and, and, and so on. The cassette interface itself is a seven pin edge connector on the back of the 328. Data input and output is handled by the 8255 Programmable Peripheral Interface or PPI integrated circuit. Pin one carries 12 volts to provide power to the cassette unit. Pin two is the read data fed into the PA7 input of the 8255. So that's the data from the cassette unit. Pin three is the write data to the cassette unit, which is output from PC5 on the 8255. Pin four, the audio, uh, that's the audio in from the audio channel on the tape, which is mixed with the system audio and fed to the system audio output, which ultimately ends up on the video connector and at your TV. Pin five is ground. Uh, pin six is the motor enable, which is output from uh, the PC4 pin on the 8255 and controls the operation of the cassette motor. And pin seven is the uh, ready signal, which appears to be a ready signal from the cassette unit, which is pulled low when the play button is pressed and fed into PA6 on the 8255. Presumably this indicates the cassette unit is ready to play and can therefore be controlled by the motor enable signal. So the system doesn't have to prompt you to, to press play on the, uh, on the cassette deck. So I've got the 903 here on the desk. About time we uh, opened the box and uh, had a look to see what condition it's in. Okay, so the box itself, it's, there's nothing remarkable. I mean, it's in reasonable condition for its age. Um, seems to have a serial number ending in 11351 for what that's worth. Um, as it notes here on the side of the box, uh, one channel for voice, one channel for data, because this is the 903. Uh, Built-in automatic recording level to theoretically ensure optimal level of well, recording levels. Built-in condenser microphone, so you can record that audio track if you want to. Uh, tape counter, so you can easily find your way back to a particular location on tape later if you need to. And doesn't require batteries or a power connector as the power is fed to it from the, uh, from the computer. Um, what else is there to say about this box? Not much. The, the writing on the back is exactly the same as on the front. All right, so let's see what we've got. Got the uh, polystyrene again with the Spectra Video logo in the top. We have the SV903 data cassette user's manual. Along with the warranty card. So this is all the regular you know, how to put a cassette in and how to connect it to your computer type information. Uh, the back page is the specifications of the unit. Um, hmm. Can you put that over there? We've got in here, what's this? The Spectra Video product catalogue from 1983, which is just a promotional flyer listing all the things you can do and get, all the different ways you can give Spectra Video your money. And what else is in here? I think the next bit is the cassette deck, which is, appears to be in its original bag with the cable. Let's see if there's anything in the bottom. Nothing in the bottom. And 
this is the deck itself. So, pop it out of the bag. So it's remarkably plain, I've got to say. I, it's just a wall of uh, sort of beige plastic and with the occasional brown bits. Um, looks to be in pretty good condition. Though. It doesn't appear to be terribly, terribly yellowed or, I mean, there's some slight yellowing, but it's not extreme. Yeah, and there's that serial number on the bottom, 11351, I think it was. Um, FCC ID. Um, attempted repair by unauthorized persons voids warranty. Yeah, well, we, we might be taking the lid off uh, just to have a look and see what state it's in internally. And then we've got our, our edge connector there which is uh, what plugs into the computer and it's got the locating pin there um, to make sure that you plug it in the right way. And, and it's actually nice that the cable comes out the side too. So when you plug it in, you don't end up with this horrible cable sticking out the back. So that's a nice touch. Um, the microphone on the front, uh, that's your microphone on and off switch. And then you've got your regular stop, rewind, fast forward, play and record buttons. Um, then where is that? No, must be. Oh, no, that's your eject button. So where's record? Oh, maybe. Maybe that's. Re maybe I should read the manual. I suspect this is record, and that's going to be a stop and eject. I reckon. Let's just have a look. Let's see what it's in. Right. Six. So this is re this is record. And yeah, two is a combined stop and eject button. Yep. So I don't know what state the heads are going to be in. I mean, they don't look terrible. I, I actually, I don't think this this tape deck's done a lot of work. It would just be my guess, because um, one of the boxes I got with this system was a floppy disk drive, and you know, if you've got a floppy disk drive, you're probably not going to be using the tape. I wouldn't think. So. I wouldn't be surprised if this tape drive came with the system as part of the bundle and it wouldn't go so far as to say it's never been plugged in, but I doubt it's done a lot of use. Okay, so we've got the computer on the bench <coughs> and you can see right there is the uh, cassette port with the notch in the middle to uh, ensure the correct polarity. So we'll get the uh, cassette deck and we've We've got the computer turned off while we're doing this, uh, obviously. And it's just a matter of getting it around the right way and plugging it in. And it's actually quite a nice fit. All right, so turn the computer on. And let's just see what, there's no tape in it at the moment. So let's just see. Pop that open to see if things. And we've got the red in use light on the front while the deck is in play mode. Uh, that should come on also while it's in record mode uh, to see you've got a visual indication that it's actually doing something. Okay, well, we've got the cassette deck plugged into the computer. Uh, let's try loading a, a tape. Um, I've got the Spectra Home Economist. Um, this sounds like the least valuable piece of software that, that came with the machine. So on the off chance that the uh, cassette deck chews it, it's the one I'll be less upset about. So let's give it a go. So tape's in very good condition, which uh, sort of supports the theory it may not have ever been used. Anyway, in we go. So. We do a C load, press play on tape. See what it does. Well, that wasn't much. 
device.io error. Play. Found intro, that's better, that's what it's supposed to do. An IO error again. I mean, it could just be that the tape's 300 years old. So we'll give it another go. That there's a few options, a few possibilities here. Uh, oops. Press play on the tape. It, it could be the edge connectors, slightly dirty, slightly oxidized. We've got the intro. Oh. Okay, so it loaded that time. Run. Oh, it looks riveting. So cape counted to zero. Yep, and press enter. Oh, righto. Well, that was a long winded way of going about loading a different program. Yeah, and we got the I.O. error again. So I might have to give that edge connector a clean, just on the off chance that there's a little bit of corrosion and it's not making a great connection. Uh, that would be, would be one possibility. I should be able to give that one a bit of a clean. Um, it's probably going to take a little bit more than some alcohol. Ooh. Yeah, a little bit gun, but I don't think that's going to be. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the problem. Um, what I might try, I'll just plug that back in so I don't lose it. We do have some magic deoxid here, which I could. A little bit. A little bit in the connector. And just give it a bit of a wiggle on and off. See if that helps it at all. So turn it back on. Rewind the tape. Load. I'm not convinced this is going to make a huge amount of difference, but we'll see. <laughs> Coupon management. I'm so excited to be managing coupons. Which is not really a thing that we even have here in Australia. Oh, we sort of do, but it's uh, not such a big thing as it is in the US. Yeah, and an IO error again. Hmm. There could be any number of things wrong with it. I mean, the tape speed, if, if the, the belts are slightly buggered and they're slipping, then uh, the tape speed might not be as high as it should be. It might be a bit of flutter in it. It's hard to know. We might have to uh, dig into the innards of it and see what's going on. On the surface, oh, hang on, what do we got going on here? What's this all about? It's just a crack in the sheath. It doesn't appear to have got down into the cable itself, so I don't think we've got a, a terrible problem there. So we've got our, which one's play again? That one. We can see the mechanism's running all right. The, the belt doesn't appear to be buggered. There's no like major kinks or anything in the belt that might be causing it to sort of flutter and vary the speed as the as the little bump goes over the 
<coughs> over the pulley. I know in, in some turntables that can be a problem. You, you have like a belt driven turntable and you just thump, 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 thump as the, uh, as the little lump in the belt goes around. Yeah, interesting. So I'm going to have to uh, break out the schematic, I think, and maybe have a look at the levels that are coming out of this thing and see if it's adjustable at all. <coughs> maybe the levels are too high or too low. So let's just try it. We'll try playing tape and see what we get on the... So there's the data, but the level is very low. So we're getting about 600 millivolts. And then of course you realize the obvious thing that you've got the oscilloscope probe in times 10 mode. So let's just change it to times one just to prove the point that we actually have six volts. So the tape deck is putting out uh, six volt uh, pulses yeah. So that sure is actually just under six volts, but uh, that, that should be sufficient. Right. So we'll just take this apart and have a quick look at the innards of it. Make sure everything is uh, is good. So that's the circuit board removed. One, two, three, and four. Right now, that should lift it out. It does. Oh, because that tape was still in there. So now we have the mechanism. So we've got this belt here that drives the tape counter, which works. Um, that's nice and free. It's nice and free. The uh, the grease in there is I can got on my fingers. It's still nice and greasy, so we don't have any issues with uh, with that. So there's your erase head, or yeah, erase head, record playback head. So everything's looking pretty much okay. I mean, this, this belt is fairly slack, but it is literally just driving the tape counter. So it doesn't need to uh, exert a whole lot of force. So that's how that comes apart. And everything looks to be in reasonable condition in there. So we will tip it back over and put it... Oh, let me just... I pop that tape out, but I can't readily get it out. That's okay. We put our four screws back in. This one with the washer goes up in the corner. So based on the uh, what I saw on the oscilloscope, oh, oscilloscope earlier, I'm fairly confident that the output level from this deck is going to be well and truly enough to drive the 8255. So I'm leaning towards there being some issue with the tape itself. Um, I, I think some magnetic tapes, or most magnetic tapes, are susceptible to like, for want of a better a better phrase, um, magnetic like bleeding between layers of the tape. So as it's on the spool, obviously one layer of tape sits on top of the next layer of tape on top of the next layer of tape. And I, I think that there can be issues with magnetic bleeding sort of between the layers um, that can corrupt data over time. 
So, I mean, that's one possibility. Um, yeah. So I, I was trying to find a, um, a cassette tape to actually do a fresh recording on and then uh, try loading that back in. But of course, being 2021, I don't have any cassette tapes, like blank cassette tapes laying around. In fact, I don't have any cassette tapes, not just blank ones. Um, and I don't really want to sacrifice one of the tapes that came with the machine. Put our lid back on, goes that way. So these screws again are going into plastic, so we need to be careful. Um, that's back on. Need to be careful not to uh, sort of cut new threads through the plastic. And that's back together. So let's see if we can get a tape, get this tape to load. Press play. Is it going to work? Maybe it's not giving me a lot of feedback. Okay, apparently it loaded. Now what? would you like to perform? List coupons. Sounds riveting. You ready to list the coupons where you say you can decide which ones to take to the store? And of course we have no coupons. I can't believe they sold this. They probably gave it away, but the ID number of the next coupon no, is one. Please take a marking pen and write this ID number on the face of the coupon. Oh, okay. Frozen. How many cents is this coupon worth? 99. Uh, 12. 12. Two, oh, two, two. Well, it's Y2K compliant by the look of it. The brand name size. Numpty ink. That'll do. Wow. Unbelievable. Five exit program. No. No, we're not going to be saving anything. Um, so all I did to um, get that tape to load was basically fast forward the tape right through to the end, rewind it back to the beginning just to sort of loosen things up, and it loaded. Okay, so we've got Spectrum here. Um, we'll uh, just open that up, get the tape out. So, upside down. So there's the, uh, the tape itself. So B. So, yeah, a fairly short tape. I mean, it says 30. I don't, I don't know whether that's in, supposed to mean 30 minutes, but uh, anyway, it's the tape, and we get an instruction manual as well. Um, so we'll drop that in the in the tape drive and uh, see if we can't get it to go. Put the manual back.
Okay, so that's a quick overview of the Spectra video cassette system and you know, what it looks like inside a quick disassembly and you know, testing it out, loading a, a game or two. It's probably the last time I'll, I'll use the cassette system. Um, this system came with a floppy disk drive. I'll most likely be using that pretty much exclusively. Anyway, if you like what you saw, uh, feel free to tap that subscribe button and ring that little bell thing and uh, yeah, I'll see you next time. Bye.